Well, good morning, everyone, wherever you're watching from or listening from. Welcome to this service that we're live streaming from St. Saviour's in Winnipeg. This is the time in the service where we always acknowledge anybody celebrating a birthday or a special anniversary. And by the way, uh, if you are in the upcoming weeks and days and so on, uh, please let Kendra know because we'd love to uh, celebrate with you uh, at a, one of our services. But this week we're celebrating the birthdays of Janet Andrews, of Michael McIntyre, and Isabella McIntyre. And so we're going to offer them the blessing. May the blessing of the Lord be upon you. We bless you in the name of the Lord. May the blessing of the Lord be upon you. We bless you in the name of the Lord. The service today is the beginning of the week of prayer for Christian unity. And the theme is chosen by the sisters of the community of Grand Sham in Switzerland. And the theme is Abide in my love, you shall bear much fruit. It is a great desire of God expressed by Jesus that we might come to him and abide in him. God waits for us tirelessly, hoping that united to him in love, we will bear fruit that will bring life to all. Faced with the difference of the other, we risk withdrawing into ourselves and seeing only that which separates us. But let us listen to how Christ calls us to abide in his love and so bear much fruit. Following the format of the service offered for the beginning of this week of prayer for Christian unity, we will have three moments of prayer. We remember the call of Christ. We turn to his love, to him who is the center of our life. For the path of unity begins in our intimate relationship with God. Abiding in his love strengthens the desire to seek unity and reconciliation with others. God opens us up to those who are different from us. This is an important fruit, a gift of healing for the divisions within us, between us and in the world. And we gather our thoughts as we say, too often we take the wonders of creation for granted. We welcome this opportunity to make a joyful noise before you. We come to bring worship and praise to our Creator, giving thanks for the beauty around us. But joyful noises are not easy for everyone because of our various situations and lifestyles. Speak to us all, God, in the stillness of this time, and remind us all your presence and love for all of creation. We offer this time of worship, O God. Let it reflect our praise and thanksgiving for the gifts of creation. And together we pray, Lord, you are the vine dresser who cares for us with love. You, you call on, on us to see the beauty of each branch united to the vine, the beauty of each person, and yet too often the differences in others makes us afraid. We withdraw into ourselves. Our trust in you is forsaken. Enmity develops between us. Come and direct our hearts toward you once again. Grant us to live from your forgiveness so that we may be together and praise your name. Amen. A litany of praise. You who call us to be praised in the midst of the earth, glory to you. We sing your praise in the midst of this, the world and among all peoples. We sing your praise in the midst of creation and among all creatures. You who call us to be praised in the midst of the earth, glory to you. We sing your praise among suffering and tears. We sing your praise among promises and achievements. 
You who call us to be praised in the midst of the earth, glory to you. We sing your praise in the places of conflict and misunderstanding. We sing your praise in the places of encounter and reconciliation. You who call us to be praised in the midst of the earth, glory to you. We sing your praise in the midst of ribs and divisions. We sing your praise in the midst of life and death, the birth of a new heaven and a new earth. You who call us to be praised in the midst of the earth, glory to you. Psalms 1 or 3. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. He forgives all your sins and heals all your infirmities. He redeems your life from the grave and crowns you with mercy and love and kindness. He satisfies you with good things and your, your youth is renewed like an eagle. The Lord executes righteousness and judgment for all who are opposed. He made his ways known to Moses and his works to the children of Israel. The Lord is full of compassion and mercy, slow to anger and of great kindness. He will not always accuse you, nor will he keep his anger forever. He has not dealt us according to our sins, nor rewarded us according to our wickedness. For as for heaven are high above the earth, so is his mercy great upon those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our sins from us. And as far as cares for his children, so does the Lord care for those who fear him. For he himself knows whomever we are made. He remembers that we are but dust. Our days are like the grass. We flourish like a flower of the field. When the wind goes over it, it's gone, and its place shall know it no more. But the merciful goodness of the Lord endures forever on those who fear him, and his righteousness on children's children. On those who keep his covenant and remember his commandments and do them, the Lord has set his throne in heaven and his kingship has dominion over all. Bless the Lord, you angels of his, you mighty ones who do his biddings and hearken to the voice of his word. Bless the Lord, all his hosts, you ministers of his who do his will. Bless the Lord, all you workers of his, in all places of his dominion. Bless the Lord, O my soul. God of infinite mercy and forgiveness, by the cross and resurrection of Jesus, your Son, you wash away your sins and deliver us from infirmities of the body and spirit, that we may live with him, reign his life, to the praise and glory of his holy name. Amen. Amen. A reading from John. I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine grower. He removes every branch in me that bears no fruit. Every branch that bears fruit he prunes to make it bear more fruit. You have already been cleansed by the word that I have spoken to you. Abide in me as I abide in you. 
Just as the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. Those who abide in me and I in them bear much fruit, because apart from me you can do nothing. Whoever does not abide in me is thrown away like a branch and withers. Such branches are gathered, thrown into the fire, and burned. If you abide in me, and my words abide in you, ask for whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. My Father is glorified by this, that you bear much fruit and become my disciples. As the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. I have said these things to you so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. This is my commandment that you love one another as I have loved you. No one has greater love than this to lay down one's life for one's friends. You are my friends if you do what I command you. I do not call you servants any longer because the servant does not know what the master is doing. But I have called you friends because I have made known to you everything that I have heard from my father. You did not choose me, but I choose you. And I appointed you to go and bear fruit, fruit that will last, so that the father will give you whatever you ask him in my name. I am giving you these commands so that you may love one another. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. And we now sing a hymn 505, Be Thou My Vision.
This morning, we pray especially for John and Eleanor, Phil and Lois, Sandy and Ted, Sarah and family, Lori, Teresa, Norman, Sylvia, and Jamie. God of love, through Christ you said to us, you did not choose me, but I chose you. You seek us, you invite us to receive your friendship and abide in it. Teach us to respond more deeply to this invitation and grow in a life that is ever more complete. God of life, you call us to be praise in the midst of the world and to welcome one another as a gift of your grace. <clears throat> May your loving gaze, which rests upon each person, open us to receive each other just as we are. The joy of our heart is in God. God who gathers, you knit us together as one vine in your Son, Jesus Christ. May your loving spirit abide in us at parish meetings and local ecumenical gatherings. Grant that together we may celebrate you with joy. The joy of our heart is in God. God of the one vineyard, you call us to abide in your love in all that we do and say. Touched by your goodness, grant us to be a reflection of that love in our homes and workplaces. May we pave the way for bridging rivalries and overcoming tensions. The joy of our heart is in God. Very often, we think of prayer as something we do, an activity of our own. In this short time, we are invited to an interior silence and to turn aside from all the noise and concerns of our lives and thoughts. In this silence, the action belongs to God. We are simply called to abide in God's love, to rest in God. This is the second vigil, the visible unity of Christians. We will now read Psalm 85. You have been gracious to your land, O Lord. You have restored the good fortunes of Jacob. You have forgiven the iniquities of your people and blotted out all their sins. You have withdrawn all your fury and turned yourself from your wrathful indignation. Restore us then, O God, our Savior. Let your anger depart from us. Will you be displeased with us forever? Will you prolong your anger from age to age? Will you not give us life again, that your people may restore it to you? Show us your mercy, O Lord, and grant us your salvation. I listen to what the Lord God is saying, for he is speaking peace to his faithful people unto those who turn their hearts to him. Truly, his salvation is very near to those who fear him, that his glory may dwell in our land. Mercy and truth have met together. Righteousness and peace have kissed each other. Truth shall spring up from the earth, and righteousness shall look down from heaven. The Lord will indeed grant prosperity, and our land will yield its increase. Righteousness shall be before him, and peace shall be the pathway of his, for his feet. God of grace, you love the world so much that you gave your only Son to be our Savior. Help us to restore in our salvation by showing mercy and truth, and by walking in the way of righteousness and peace. We ask this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Amen.
A reading from Corinthians. Now I appeal to you, brothers and sisters, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you be in agreement, and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be united in the same mind and the same purpose. For it has been reported to me by Chloe's people that there are quarrels among you, my brothers and sisters. What I mean is that each of you says, I belong to Paul, or I belong to Apollos, or I belong to Cephas, or I belong to Christ. Has Christ been divided? This is the word, word of the Lord. Thanks be And we now sing hymn number 7070, Jesus, the Joy of Loving Hearts. into prayer. Holy Spirit, you create and recreate the church in all places. Come and whisper in our hearts the prayer which Jesus addressed to his Father on the eve of his passion, that they may all be one, so that the world may believe. Lord, Lord have mercy. Lord Jesus, Prince of Peace, light the fire of love in us, so that suspicions, contempt, and misunderstanding sees in the church. May, may the walls that separate us fall. Lord, have mercy. Holy Spirit, Consoler of all, <clears throat> open our hearts to forgiveness and reconciliation and bring us back from our wanderings. Lord, Lord have mercy. Lord Jesus, gentle and humble of heart, 
Give us poverty of spirit so that we may become or may welcome the unexpectedness of your grace. Lord, Lord have, have mercy. mercy. Holy Spirit, you never abandon the men, women, and children who are persecuted for the fidelity to the gospel. Give them strength and courage and support those who help them. Lord, Lord have, have mercy. The Lord calls us to be united among ourselves. He gives us his peace and invites us to share it. Let us exchange a socially distant sign of his peace with our neighbors. Peace be with you. And our offering him is number 430. Will you come and follow me?
A reading from the book of Revelation. After I looked, uh, sorry, after this I looked, and there was a great multitude that no one could count, from every nation, from all tribes, and peoples, and languages, standing before the throne, and before the Lamb, robed in white, with palm branches in their hands, they cried out <clears throat> in a loud voice, saying, <clears throat> sorry, <clears throat> Salvation belongs to our God, who is seated on the throne and to the Lamb. And all the angels stood around the throne and around the elders and the four living creatures, and they fell on their faces before the throne and worshipped God, singing, Amen, blessing and glory and wisdom, and thanksgiving and honour and power and might. Be to our God forever and ever. Amen. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Good morning again. Good morning. Good morning. You know, it's often been said that um, actions speak louder than words. But I've come to discover over many years that they both can pack quite a bit of punch. Some of the words that uh, we're invited to say when uh, we're asked to respond to something, <clears throat> we sort of always uh, come up with something quickly and on the spot. We don't often get enough time to actually think about what we want to say. And yet uh, those words are out there and uh, you're going to live with them one way or the other, hopefully most in a good way, but oftentimes maybe not. About um, five years ago I arrived at the Loop uh, outside of the Main Street Project and Salvation Army and so on downtown and we we're going to be serving some food to some of the patrons that spend a lot of their life in that area. And I got there early that day and um, uh, before the rest of the crew came, so it wasn't time to uh, serve. But I got talking to one of the, the people that appeared to be going to be joining us a little bit later. So he asked me, he hadn't recognized me, I hadn't recognized him. But he said, what brings you down here? And I said, well, I'm part of a group that is going to be serving a, a beautiful meal at about five o'clock. And then he said to me, so why well, you do that, what, because it makes you feel good? And he caught me off guard a little bit, but I came up with as quick an answer as I could. And I said, well, no, actually, um, I have some food and I have a feeling that uh, maybe you and some of your friends might be hungry. So that's what brings me here. But we chatted a little bit further. We never really got back into that little topic. Uh, and I haven't really addressed those words much in the last five years. But why was I there? I was there on behalf of the Gifts of Grace Street Mission. Those are some interesting words in itself, the Gifts of Grace. Uh, the, that group, that's an organization, if you're not already aware, that's a street mission, the Gifts of Grace Street Mission. And it was founded in the parish hall right here at St. Saviour's about eight years ago, uh, under the auspices of St. Saviour's, but also in conjunction with many, many, many more volunteers. And that night, when we came up with the idea, uh, there was probably more other, more than attendants than actually belong to this parish. And many of those are from um, the Transcona United Church and remain uh, tremendous volunteers in that mission to this very day. I didn't come up with the name, but somebody did, and the Gifts of Grace uh, kind of was a cool name because uh, it is uh, by the grace of God actually that we're given all the gifts that allow us uh, to do many of the things that we do. And so I'll take you back 25 years ago. I was just finishing up uh, a golf tournament that I was one of the co-organizers of. It was the first year of doing it, a tournament that would go on for about another 20 years after that. And we were sitting enjoying a beer after, and one of the fellows that also assisted that day said to me, Campbell, why is it that you do what you do? 
And I said, well, I do what I do because those of us that have uh, have an obligation to those that don't. And I think he understood that to me and those of us that maybe have money, I was also thinking maybe it's skills and some time and some energy. Um, but he went on to say, so what, what happens if uh, those of us don't share the same uh, things that we have that maybe you do? And I pulled out another nugget out of the door and I said, well, you know, um, I thought I had it bad when I had no shoes until I met somebody that had no feet. And so we left it there and uh, I thought about that from time to time over the years. Um, maybe I could have come up with a better response. But, but let's park that later and let's park those other two comments for later. When you heard the opening remarks uh, from Edmund about the service, it's the week of Christian unity. And the theme is abide in my love and you shall bear much fruit. Now there's an interesting word love and you're going to hear a lot of that today. If you get into the lessons that you heard uh, Kim uh, read, uh, you're going to hear that love very strongly. In John 15, we hear God is the vine and we are the branches. And we learn from there that we can only bear fruit that we're invited to do uh, if we remain connected to the vine. If we leave that vine, then we lose our ability to bear fruit. And there's, uh, you know, some of these lessons in the Psalms that Ian were reading, there's so many uh, contemporary hymns that came to my mind as I was <laughs> reading them. And the one I was thinking about here is one that we sing a lot here at this parish, His Banner Over Me Is Love. And you know that there's one verse in particular that goes like this. He is the vine and we are the branches, His banner over me is love. He is the vine and we are the branches, His banner over me is love. He is the vine and we are the branches, His banner over me is love. His banner over me is love. And you heard love a lot in that. And then the chorus, because God loves you and I love you and that's the way it should be. Hallelujah, God loves you and I love you and that's the way it should be. And so you've heard love a lot in there. Another word. We get in, continue on in John 15 and we hear about love thy neighbor. Edmund talked about that last, last week in the story of the Good Samaritan. But you know, there's a confusing word, there's a lot of connotations, because we use it a lot in all kind of different ways. I use it when I'm talking about things that I actually like a lot. I say, I love to cruise. I love lemon pie. I love to golf. I love to watch golf. I even heard my wife say it many times when she's talking about the children. She said, I always love my children, but I haven't always liked them. Uh, talking about she doesn't like some of their activities, some of the things that uh, they were doing, but she's always loved them. But I'm not sure that's the love that was being talked about in John 15. I think it's a much, much deeper love, true affection, in fact, for our fellow persons. And that gets a little bit tough uh, when you're thinking our love and strong affection for all of our fellow children of God when we think that our current U.S. president is one of those children of God and others that we don't find as inviting. So I thought I needed to actually figure out what is Christian unity. And so I read a commentary, and it's interesting that the person that I was reading says that unity among two or more people gets its, gets its virtue from something else. In other words, unity itself is neutral until it's given goodness or badness by something else. Now think about that, it's neutral until something gives unity goodness or badness. And we know again, coming back to the U.S. President, we know that <clears throat> some of those actions caused unity at least amongst a certain group. But it's not unity that Christians necessarily would be proud of. And the commentary goes on and says that not just uh, unity, but Christian unity. Um, actually, it says that it's never ever enough just to call Christians to simply have unity. Because that could be good or bad depending on context. 
and, it, and its place in history. And Edmund talked about that as well last week when he talked about the literal translations of some of the texts. Uh, because all of these things that we're asked uh, to think about and, and be unified uh, with actually are ever-changing. Uh, and so uh, it is sometimes very difficult even to find that Christian unity, and maybe that's one of the reasons it's an ongoing theme. Uh, as Christians, we haven't actually found it yet. So this commentary goes on to invite us to consider uh, how do you get this thing called Christian unity? And he goes on to say that it comes, it gets its goodness from its source, its views, its affections, and its aims. And of course we know the source is God. And not just God, but God through the Holy Spirit. And it all originates from our love of God and God's loves for us. That mutual love that we share. Because everything comes out of that. And we read it, we hear in the, the first and great commandment. The love that is spoken about, and it says that thou shalt love the Lord with all thy heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy mind. That's the type of love that is different than the love of lemon pie, for example. And then our views, and they must be like-minded. If we're going to achieve Christian unity, our views must be like-minded. Now this is a challenge, because they don't necessarily start out that way. And even if they do, they're ever-evolving. The world is changing. Our views change. The views of people that we associate with change. And as we're going to continue on in our quest for Christian unity, we have to be adaptable to all of those changes. Uh, and that is not a simple task, because some of them um, actually are puzzlers. Do we or don't we? Should we or should we? Um, and uh, there's a lot of barriers that get in the way. And if you're like me, put up your hand if you've changed your views from time to time. And then it talks about affection, love, deep, deep love. And this is where it really gets tough. Because doing good for the family of God is more than just good deeds. Because we know we can do good deeds for people we don't know. We can probably do good deeds for people we don't even like, especially if they're part of a larger group. But love, true affection, becomes the big ask. ask. The commentary I was reading suggests that Christian unity will only be achieved when all Christians share the same affection for God and for each other. And I guess that means, and I know that it means in fact, that we're going to keep, have to keep the steady course with the knowledge that at times we're going to be giving more love than we're giving back. But that's part of our challenge as Christmas, uh, Christians. And then the aims, and the commentator says that the unity God is talking about is designed to have at least two aims. One of them is we must be a witness to the world, and the other is an acclamation of God's glory and God's grace. One of the songs that's not on the hymn list today uh, is they'll know we are Christians by our love. And verse 1 talks about our mission. What is our mission as Christians? And this song goes like this. We are one in the Spirit. We are one in the Lord. We are one in the Spirit. We are one in the Lord. And we pray that all unity will one day be restored. And they'll know we are Christians by our love, by our love. And they'll know we are Christians by our love. Now there's that word again, love. The, uh, that song goes on, verse uh, 2 and 3 talk about walking and working together and guarding each person's dignity and saving each other's pride. Strong, strong very words that we need to think about. And then verse 4 puts the praise where it belongs. And we heard that in one of the lessons today as well. All praise to the Father from whom all things come. And all praise to Christ Jesus, his only Son. And all praise to the Spirit who makes us one. 
and they'll know we are Christians by our love, by our love, and they'll know we are Christians by our love. And there's that word love again. So we parked a few things to come back to and the stories that I told right at the top of this uh, message. And we talked about the words that you use and in reflection now you start to think, well, what other words could I have used? And I, I think about that question I asked 25 years ago. And I think we we're all thinking in the terms of, in the context of money, of time, of talents, of skills, all of the textbook definition of stewardship. Maybe that's what I was thinking. But it was something that I always knew, I mean, I always knew that why I do what I do is because I have an obligation. But I hadn't really given it much thought in the last 25 years. But what we know now, at least what I figured out while I'm working on this session, um, is the one thing that I didn't pick up on, and that was love. The mutual love was actually the pot, or the, stir, the stir that, straw that stirred the pot of all the things that I kind of knew deep within me uh, why I do things. So it wasn't just the fact that I had some time and skills and maybe even some resources, but I was driven by the mutual love. Then in, uh, we talked in the op at the top of the uh, service, abide in my love and you'll bear much fruit. And I really do like this for a few reasons. Maybe my witness has already borne some fruit. Maybe some of the seeds I've already planted and can still plant will bear fruit long after I'm gone. Because I have to acknowledge that I'm still learning, still trying to understand if my words, my deeds, and my actions hold up to the challenge of offering dignity, justice, and fairness, and love to all people. And we parked something else that uh, a question that I answered five years ago, and that was where the gentleman asked me, why was I there? And I said, well, uh, uh, I think I'm here to, to feed you, because you may be hungry. And maybe on reflection now, five years later, thinking about the impact of those words, maybe I simply should have said, because God loves you and I love you and that's the way it should be. Hallelujah! God loves you and I love you and that's the way it should be. Amen. Amen. All the intercessions are inspired by a text of Dorotheus of Gaza. <clears throat> we are called to be ministers of God's healing and reconciling love. This work can only be fruitful when we abide in God as branches of the true vine, which is Jesus Christ. As we come closer to God, we draw closer to one another. Imagine a circle drawn on the ground. Imagine that this circle is the world. The center represents God, and the paths to the center are different ways people live. When people living in this world, desiring to draw closer to God, walk toward the center of the circle. To the extent that they move closer to the center, to God, the move closer to one another, and the closer they come to one another, the closer they come to God. With the words that Jesus taught us, let us now pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. 
For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Our next hymn is hymn number 441. Thee will I love, my strength, my tower. I'm gonna let it shine. 